Welcome back to another episode of the program. Today we are going to examine this article that came out of Smithsonian by way of this research article that came out of Nature titled Ancient DNA Sheds Light on Europe's Hunter-Gatherers. And these researchers looked at the genomes of several hundred people who lived be, uh, during this time period and they belonged to a culture called the Gravettian culture, which we'll get uh, more into in a second here. This uh, research article... Uh, looked at human movement and the genetic a ancestry of the Gravettian people, as this was the first ancient DNA study to include people from the Gra Gravettian culture who were a group of mammoths and reindeer hunters that lived in caves and shelters alongside these megafauna. And they even had uh, sculptures that were carved from th their tusks. They built yurt-like structures out of some of the material from hunting these big animals. So in this study, they analyzed 356 ancient hunter-gatherer genomes, including new genomic data for 116 individuals from 14 countries in Western and Central Eurasia, uh, spanning 35,000 to 5,000 years ago. Uh, the researchers discovered that two Gravettian populations, one in Western Europe and the other in Southern Europe, were genetically distinct, despite being associated with the same culture. So for the longest time, th this... There's been a lot of, even now, there's been a lot of confusion and a lot of different perspectives on exactly what the genetic makeup was of the early Europeans during this time period. If what these researchers say is true, and if, if what their interpretation of the data is correct, then yeah, it's definitely groundbreaking because they identified a genetic ancestry profile in individuals associated with these populations from Western Europe that is distinct from the contemporaneous groups related to this culture in Central and Southern Europe, and instead resembled that of preceding individuals associated with the Argnosian culture, which is the culture, culture immediately preceding the Gravettian. So there was, and that's understandable, there's two different uh, populations mixing here, largely because, again, there's climate shifts going on, people aren't stationary like trees. They're more like um, molecule, water molecules in a bottle, constrained by geography and climate. So this ancestry profile that the researchers uh, call survived during the last LGM between 25 to 19,000 years ago in human populations from Southwestern Europe, which is basically uh, the Iberian Peninsula. A little bit later, the culture re-expanded northeastward after the LGM. So in other words, the Western Gravettians managed to survive by taking refuge in the Iberian Peninsula in the southwest and then migrated back northeast across the continent when the climate shifted again. When, there was a, when the Earth was entering the Balling Alarod period and, and there was a, a warming trend before the Younger Dryas impact. So this is between probably like... 17,000 years ago is around the time the Gravettians stop uh, existing according to, or they become something else depending on who you ask. So there's also a second study that s supports this study that was also published in, in the week before in Nature, which examined the 23,000 year old fossilized teeth, which was found in Southwestern Europe. And this should place it right smack dab during the time of the Gravettian culture and when the Western Gravettians should have occupied the area. And of course, uh, they confirm that this, quote, Malamorso individual, which is in southern Spain, carried genetic ancestry that directly connected with early R. Ignacian associated individuals. So again, we see this continuity of culture that moves down into um, southwestern uh, Europe. And if you contrast this with a different scenario, also in a different part of Europe, Italy, the individuals there are associated with the transition from pre and post LGM carry a different genetic ancestry. So again, this suggests different dynamics in the proposed southern refuge area of Ice Age Europe and posits Siberia as a potential refuge for Western Europeans right before the last glacial maximum. So this is a separate study that confirms the first study that there indeed was the existence of this, of this uh, group that didn't just die off and disappear. They, they moved and, and survived and became something else. 
And so, um, meanwhile, there is another southern population of Gravettians, independent of the western ones they, that, that split. And they ended up disappearing after the last glacial maximum and were replaced by a population from the Balkans. D depending on who you ask, it, they have a different name. This new group, uh, for the sake of this uh, article, we'll just call it the Ep Epigravettians. And then they spread for, from the south across the rest of Europe around 14,000 years ago and mixed with a population that had spread across the continent from Iberia. So these, so the southern... So the southern and western Gravettians, they split up for a few thousand years and they, they came back and remixed from about 14,000 years ago, according to this article. Uh, and then from then on, an ancestry related to this culture spread from the south across the rest of Europe, largely replacing the Magdalenian associated gene pool. And after about a period of admixture that spanned the beginning of the Mesolithic, genetic interactions between Western and Eastern European hunter-gatherers appear who were also characterized by marked differences in phenotypically relevant variants. So again, around one of the, um, there are a lot of uh, theories around this. One of, one of the um, prominent ones come from one of the researchers and he says around at that time, forests grew across Europe, and as the climate warmed, the new hybrid population became the dominant one, perhaps because these people were better at hunting in forests, or maybe they had some, some sort of strategy that uh, outcompeted other, other individuals. Well, anyway, uh, I thought this was an interesting, um, thought-provoking uh, research. Obviously, everything's a work in progress. There's a ton of different theories about what was going on during that time, and and things can get pretty heated for whatever reason. That, uh, a lot of uh, people, like I said, when you talk about genetics and, and when people who share those genetics are involved in their study, ideology be gets really uh, taken seriously and is uh, thrown about and, and stuff like that. But if... If more and more research like this comes out and more and more dots are, are connected and proposed, if, you know, ideally that does become criticized and, and hopefully a, a better and more parsimonious theory will rise out of those ashes and kind of like a blacksmith, you know, you just got to keep uh, hammering out the impurities and all the false leads. Uh, but yeah, this, with that being said, this is from mainstream academia. I mean, Nature Magazine is one of the more um, respected in um in the quote scientific community but you know take everything with a grain of salt and it's nice to see something new uh come out especially during the time of the last glacial maximum